Hi there and welcome to Catholic Magazine. My name is Michelle Abraham Ali and this is a weekly presentation. It's good of you to join us. Uh, welcome to a very special interview. Today we have the privilege of chatting with a dynamic woman, Dr. Faith Harding. And she's a friend of the church. She's a friend of Guyana. She's a patriotic Guyanese, Dr. Faith Harding. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And you know, when we hear the word faith, what comes to mind? Well, personally, it's about trust, confidence in someone and in religion. It's it's like the doctrine of a particular religion, but the person Faith Harding, Dr. Faith Harding, who is she? We and you have uh, you have the privilege of joining us today and learning a little bit more about this woman. Dr. Harding, welcome to our interview today. And thank you very much. This, for me, is a very special privilege. It's oh. wonderful. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Tell us about yourself. Well, I'm this little girl from Albertown, Georgetown, Guyana, that has great dreams of being someone dedicated to her country, committed to the people of Guyana, and in essence to the people of the world because I like working with people and I've had the opportunity to work around the world on every continent, uh, bringing hope and faith to mm -hmm. people around the world and I'd really like to have a greater impact in our country. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, not that very long, uh, we were, and I suppose you wear many hats, Dr. Harding, a politician, a humanitarian, you're a grandma, a relatively new grandmother yes. and a mom, <laughs> uh, but which of the hats or which of your roles, be it academic, politician, humanitarian, which brings greatest joy to you or do they overlap? They overlap, especially the academic with the humanitarian because I think my teaching, my learning from home as well as at the university brought me the opportunity to understand the human mind and therefore want to contribute to their lives in a humanitarian way. So when I work, I work with the understanding that I'm bringing, making someone else's life a little better than it was before. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about the Faith Harding Impact Program. I think that's more, more yes. relatively in our minds now. Yes, it's very current. And it started out with me having been in Liberia, in East Timor, and in Sudan where I saw the need for projects to have a quick impact because people had just come out of war, in some cases 50 years of war, that left the country totally depleted and people disillusioned with life. And they needed quick impact in their lives. That they, Their backs were against the wall. Didn't do, they didn't know where to move to. And it meant that anything that you had to do for those people had to be of quick impact. So out of that experience of getting the UN, the United Nations, to do something immediately for people was quite a challenge, but it happened. It worked um, in my role which is managing the, the programs that would rehabilitate the country. First from discussion, joining with the government of Liberia, for instance, to help to impact people's lives immediately. They needed basic things, a roof over their head, food to eat, water to drink, um, ability to move from one place to another in some sense of safety, and in engage in those who were governing, I was able to bring those things to people, to get them health by building, putting up health um, facilities for people so that they, they can go to a hospital or to a clinic, in many cases clinics, or to get law, the law of order, um, to be in place right away. We had to build police stations, for instance, because police were meeting under trees they had a desk or a piece of wood and, and, and some paper and a pen. Mm -hmm. And that's how they dealt with cases. And one magistrate had a home, and that's where he would keep prisoners or people that he wanted to go to prison. He would put them in a room in his house. So something had to be done about that. And after war, it, it, it isn't easy to get the financing to do these things right away. And I had to thank those who were working at the UN in the field missions section to understand the problems and to support the people of Liberia and giving funds immediately 
have something like that. So in Guyana, I wanted, I saw some poverty. I saw people just living half an hour away from Georgetown, not having water, electricity, uh, and jobs. But yet they had land and didn't know that that land was wealth to them. So I wanted to make a quick impact in their lives and to help them to move from where they were into understanding that they, they can do something for themselves without government intervention. And that is to use their land, resources, and the things that they had learned to make their lives a little better and just pull it out of them and to move them along. People who were despondent and were suicidal, to be able to counsel them, to move them out, to bring hope to their lives, and, and that's what the Quick Impact was about. Of course, I what I did was donate 40% uh, of the salary I earned from the World Bank in the Sudan, and that, that salary was quite a good salary. So I put aside quite a large sum of money, a couple of millions, and I've used it up in helping people uh, to, uh, to understand that the resources they have can make a life for them, no matter how small or great. Mm -hmm. You have to use those resources. In, in one case, in, in Long Creek, for instance, you had some women with 30 acres of land, and, and it was all under grass and trees. Mm -hmm. So to help them, I brought them together as a community into a group that could then clear the land and do some planting and get some money for that. And, and, and I sought overseas markets, which would bring them a lucrative um, sum of money. But you've gone a little further than that. It has uh, several mm -hmm. aspects there, is scholarships. Yes, you know, yes. Like and out of that, we were able to give two scholarships every year to persons going to the University of Diana. Well, it's at all levels that we gave. The money would be less as it went down to nursery. But it's from the University of Diana to secondary schools, people, for instance, who go to President's College and have to live in, and they need weekly assistance. So they would get a scholarship for like $30,000, $40,000 um, every semester, or a little more than that sometimes. Um, but that it was set at I think fifty thousand dollars. Then the primary school would get twenty five thousand and the nursery ten thousand dollars. So those children were able to to have better lives or hope and mm -hmm. and faith in people and going to school, mm -hmm. get some support. Uh, we're chatting with Dr. Faith Harding. If you're now tuning in to Catholic Magazine, we're learning a little bit about her, and uh, we're happy that she can take the time out to be with us today. Let's switch gears a little bit, Dr. Harding, and and turn to a more personal side, a more religious side of you doing this kind of work um, that you've been doing for years. Um, it seems that there is a deeper spiritual side that that is guiding you, that is pointing you in the direction where it's needed. Uh, talk to us about your spiritual life. It's it's uh, very personal. I, I haven't been christened, so to speak, in any church. I was well, baptized, really. I was baptized when I was a child, a baby, in the Anglican faith. Um, since then, I've gone to several denominations, uh, one being Catholic, where my husband is a Catholic for all his life. He used to be an altar boy. But what had impressed me about the Catholic Church was what my mother said when my little sister was born, because the entire family were Anglicans and my mom had said that for her she wanted to change for my little sister because the Catholic Church seemed to be more involved in people's lives especially families they would come out and visit and give a lot of assistance and that impacted on my mind and so I've always had this impression that the Catholic Church is a given church one that doesn't only depend on you coming to church, but the church is involved in people's lives. So I've been going with my husband. We go at least once per month to Fatima. And I also go to the Anglican church because of the tradition of my family. But I say this to say that I'm guided by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. You know, so I just recalling something that happened after Mr. Forbes Burnham died, our former president. 
I dreamt him like two days after his death. We were walking down by Fogarty's on Water Street and I was turning the corner to go to St. George's and he said to me, don't go there, go to Brick Dam. And I wondered why he said that because I know that he was having, or I perceived the Catholic Church to be against him a lot in his administration. And here he was telling me, I would like you to go to Brick Dam. You know, and, and that has stuck in my mind. I haven't done much about it except I go to the church sometimes for quiet moments to pray or to make a donation through the boxes there. But that is as much as I've done. And, and now that we're talking, I'm saying, well, really, why did he tell me to do that? I need to do more about it. But, you know, Dr. Harding, um, you know, in what many have, have said, you know, Ghana seems divided and we need healing and we need to be our brother's okay. keeper. What, what do we need to be doing as, as citizens of our country? You have been doing it guided by your expectations and your values and so on. But generally, what do you think we we as citizens can do for our country. We need to stop and think about what brings love, what brings growth, what brings development. And the only way that I see development taking place in a holistic fashion is for us to trust each other, for us to want to reach out and help, and to remember that we are Guyanese, we are all Guyanese. All those persons that are, for instance, leaders in our country, political leaders are Guyanese. And we need to understand each other. We need to stop and know that nobody really wants to take your life away. But how can we help? to better those lives is what is important. And we must not only think about ourselves or our past experiences, but think what we can provide for the coming generations. What can we provide for those people who are hurting right now? And it doesn't help for us to be antagonistic to each other because when you're antagonistic, you shout, you scream, you hate. But when you love, when you trust, you want to give, you want to share, you want to see the better in some person. You want to bring out the best. And what I see happening doesn't bring out the best in anybody, but it puts people's backs against the wall. And, and this goes for the leadership in the opposition as well as the government. You know, if somebody criticizes you or somebody finds that you're doing something wrong or something that is, may not be wrong, but it isn't helpful, it doesn't make people grow. You need to stop and think and to accept and to join, to see how you can, mm -hmm. can change the situation for the better. There's no need cussing out or going into a cuss mode, so to speak, and to um, try to damage another person's reputation rather than help that person to grow. So you would definitely advocate for more understanding, love, respect for each other in your offices, yes? Yeah. Um, is there any words of encouragement you'd like to share with uh, uh, viewers of Catholic Magazine from any denomination that might be watching us at this point? I think it's important to understand yourself and your needs very clearly. To remember that bad thoughts generate bad actions. And that if you can give and create good thoughts in your mind, then you would have good actions. You see, in people's minds, it's what you call a germ. Because if you put a bad germ into someone's stomach, for instance, the body rejects it. Our bodies are wholesome. And they need wholesome things going in, just so as the mind. The mind needs a wholesome thought so that it can generate. If you have good thoughts, then good will come out of you. If you have bad thoughts, then bad will come out because the body rejects it. You see, so I would like to know that everybody throws away the bad thoughts and generate how can I better this situation. If you're feeling sad and downtrodden, if you're feeling depressed, how can I get out of this mood? What good things are happening in my life? And generate more of those good things that are happening in your life. Well, it has to be you. It has to be an It has to be effort. you. Mm -hmm. And you can seek help if it isn't happening for you. Okay. 
because we have a lot of people who are depressed. A lot of the people that you see hanging on corners, drinking, and getting themselves drunk to the extent where their thoughts are warped, they're depressed persons. They, and so they seek help to forget through using alcohol or drugs. I want to ask those persons to really explore their minds and to see where the pain is coming from and seek help for that pain. Too many are people turn to violence because of the pain inside of them. And so you find a rise in crime, a rise in murders, and, and things that don't help our nation. We're a small nation. We've got a nation to build. And you really need to start out thinking of good things that can help to build our nation. Well, thank you very much for those kind words, Dr. Harding, and thank you on behalf of the numerous um, numbers of, of, of Guyanese who have benefited directly and indirectly from, from your work and your efforts and your endeavors within their communities. Please continue doing what you do and continue to mentor us as women and continue to be that, uh, that shred of faith and light and hope in the lives of Guyanese. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much.